heaven. It's going to be great. Are you excited about hearing the Word of God tonight? I hope you are. Looking forward to it. It's just been a good, good feast around God's table. Welcome back to the pulpit. Our evangelist, Charles Tooney Cash. Hope you've had a good day. Oh, I do not have my PA on. I'll take care of that. He pointed it. Mm -hmm. I've got to turn it on. Uh-oh, you've got a dead battery. Do what? I can use pulpit. Yeah, the light's not coming on, so it must be a dead battery. No light. Okay, can you hear me? All right, I thought you could anyway. Okay, it is a joy to be back uh, this evening in the service, and good to see all of you here. Did you hear about... The two fellows that lived on either side of this river. And um, I suppose they were Baptists because they was all time a fussing at one another. And uh, one lived on one side of the river and one on the other. And, and so they was always a fussing and a hollering at one another and, and across the river. And their names was, were, was, was Rufus and Clarence. And uh, so Rufus would see Clarence out across the river. And he'd holler over there, Bob said, Clarence, buddy, you better be glad I can't swim or I'd swim over there and whip you real good. And after a while, Clarence would see Rufus out and he said, Rufus, oh boy, you better be glad I can't swim because you'd really know who was boss around here. I'd swim over there and whip you real good and let the world know and the community know and everybody else know who's boss around here. Well, that continued on for years. But on one particular occasion, one of those years, this... Uh, uh, group came in and uh, company and built a bridge across the river. And once they did that, almost immediately the threatening and hollering at each other across the river stopped. So one day, Rufus's wife said to Rufus, said, Rufus, I may mean to talk to you about something. I said, I used to hear you outside of hollering across the river at Clarence about every day or so, saying, Clarence, if I could swim, I'd swim over there and whip you real good. But I've noticed now, since we have a bridge across the river, you don't uh, threaten him anymore. I mean, uh, uh, you wouldn't have to swim. You could just go across the bridge and whip him. Are you afraid of Clarence? You, you think I'm afraid of Clarence? I'll go over there right now and prove to him and you and the world who's boss. I think I'm afraid of Clarence. And so out of the house went Rufus in a rage. Well, he'd hardly gotten out of the house until he came back, uh, looking like a scared whip pup. And Rufus's wife said, now, wait a minute, Rufus. I'm not sure you had time to go over there and whip Clarence. He said, um, no, not really. He said, not only that, he said, I'm not even sure you had time to get across the bridge. Well, to be honest with you, said Rufus, I, I didn't. And uh, no, that you're, you're back here looking like a scared whip pup. What's going on? He said, now, honey, I want you to know something. All those years you heard me a hollering at Clarence across the river telling him if I'd swim, I'd swim over there and whip him real good. I meant every word of that. And moments ago when I said to you that I was going to swim over the, there or go across that bridge, brother, and whip Clarence and prove to him and the world and you the, who's boss, I meant every word of that. But a strange thing happened. As I was crossing that bridge, said about halfway across, I looked up and I saw this little plaque-like thing hanging down, which read, Clarence, 13 feet, 9 inches. <laughs> he never looked that tall across the river. <laughs> well, well, you got that, didn't you? Clar Clarence, 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 you, you've seen that as you go around the fast food play. Clarence, uh, uh, eight foot and four inches, whatever, you know. Well, that one said nine feet and six inches. Okay, 
Well, it is good to see you here uh, uh, tonight in the service. Now, tomorrow night, as far as we know, should be the last night of our revival services. I have thoroughly enjoyed being here. Uh, the days are just moving along so rapidly. I can hardly believe they pass that quick, but they do. And, uh, and tomorrow night will be our last service, as far as we know. And uh, as I told you last evening, as uh, we were about ready to leave, tomorrow night I, I want us to, to listen to one of my friends who's in our evangelistic group. Her name is Carolyn Reed, and uh, there's a particular song. Matter of fact, it's a medley of three, involving three songs. And uh, I want you to hear that. And remember, I've already told you that her mom and dad were opera singers. And she learned to sing from mo listen to mom and dad. And uh, her dad did one of the first stars and calls, you know, years ago. And uh, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, you, you're going to be blessed by hearing her sing, but you'd be even more blessed if you could just see her as she puts herself into her singing. I mean, it's something else to behold. And so uh, uh, and she calls it my song. It's a song I usually ask, request. Well, I don't even have to request it anymore. She knows if I'm around, she's singing. She's got to sing Tooney's song. Amen? And so you will enjoy it, I believe, tomorrow evening as we come together for the last service. So I uh, uh, hope that you'll tell somebody tomorrow about the service and uh, bring them with you, amen, to the service. All right, let's uh, stand and make our confession. All right, you remember our little confession, do you not? You hold up your Bible toward heaven and repeat after me and the louder the better. Here we go. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Tonight I'll be taught the word of God. I will never be the same. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living, Seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, ever, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalms 34. Or as one fellow called it, the book of splasms. <laughs> but it's not splasms, it's psalms. Like one fellow I heard about said when he got saved, he didn't know John 3, 16. He called Psalms palms and Job job and couldn't even pronounce Deuteronomy and said the first sermon he preached was from the book of Concordance. So we hope to beat that tonight. Ms. Phillips, it's so good to have you back with us tonight. I hope I look as good as you do when I'm 89. <laughs> Amen. Amen, I tell you. My secretary's dad was 102. I had his funeral service, and when he was 100, my, so he didn't look much over 70. He was as spry as could be, and but he died at 102. And, and by the way, my secretary, the uh, I just made it to she's written some books and I've been having them available right here. We got rid of what was there last night, but I brought a couple more of each one of them tonight in case somebody else would like a book. You can pick one of those uh, books up. And she's, get, she's in the process of writing a new book about marriage. And uh, preacher's wife has already <laughs> told me to make sure Ronnie got one of them when <laughs> she got it uh, written. And also, uh, let's see, where's your cousin at back there, honey? There, uh, yes, yes, it will make sure that Dennis, isn't it? Yeah, he needs one too. I've heard about that too. Okay, good. We'll, we'll make sure that they both get a hold of one, all right? Because they greatly need it from what their wives say. And you know these wives would always tell you the truth. Amen? Psalm 34. But if you like one of those books, you can see me after the service. Psalm 34. Writes... The psalmist, David, I will bless the Lord 
at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The other shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. That's reading four verses of Psalm 34. My secretary that has written several books, two of which I've had with me here this week, used to write uh, as a journalist, I guess you'd call her, at the Press Chronicles. John C. Press Chronicle. And she told me one time that the, when you go out to do a story as a journalist, the journalistic approach is known as the 5W approach. Who, what, when, where, and why. So tonight, I want us to look at these four verses of scriptures as we think on the subject of Praise, P-R-A-I-S-E, not prayer, but praise. And as we look at this subject, I want us to view it and view these verses from that journalistic viewpoint of approaching a story. Who, what, when, where, and why. All right? Somebody has said that praise, certainly prayer always helps, amen, but somebody said, praise given, you know, from our hearts will deliver the Christian out of most of the difficulty that he or she finds himself or herself in. And I'm prone to believe that. Amen. Learning to praise the Lord from your heart. So let's follow that little approach now. May we do that using these verses of Scripture. Who, and thinking about praise, who shall do it? Well, David says, I will, whether Bob does, whether Wayne does, whether Dennis does, whether Ronnie does, whether Wayne does, or anyone else does. David says, I'm not going to get left out on this element of the Christian life. I will. Yeah. Amen. I like what the old black preacher said one time at the evangelism conference where I was at. He said, you know, he said, the, the Bible say that if we don't praise the Lord, the stones shall cry out. The old black boy said, I don't want a stone to do in my hollering for me. I'm going to holler myself. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not talking about that every time you come to church, that you're, try, that you're uh, supposed to try to get something whipped up in the energy of the flesh and clap your hands and stomp your feet and holler hallelujah without the slice idea of what you're hollering hallelujah about and jump on every bandwagon that comes along, not knowing who's ahead of the band or where the band's headed. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just talking about when the Lord really grips your heart. I mean, and down inside you just really feel the Holy Spirit blessing you in such a wonderful way and squeezes your heart until the honey starts running out and the, and, and, and the, and the honey pond gets full and the pancake house, you know, gets full and, and, and runs off. And, and I, when, when the Lord just blesses you in such a way, you just can't help it but to say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know Brother Harrod Step, don't you? Oh, my soul. How many of you know Harrod Step? Would you raise your hand? Something to do. And I'm, you talk about somebody that shouts and loves God. I, I went down to the crusade four or five nights when he was carrying on down there here recently. I'm telling you, he, he liked to have a spell. I, he's got to lose about six or eight pounds about every service. I think the way he runs around and shouts, praises God. But let me tell you something. He's that way wherever you see him. I don't care if it's in church, out, out on the street, wherever you see Howard, he's a shouting and a praise of God. They call him shouting Howard Eastep. But there's nothing wrong with shouting uh, when it's from the heart. Amen? But there's thing of, uh, would you mind holding by? Maybe I might shout after a while. I'm not sure I'm for that kind of shouting, you know. But uh, when the Lord just gets a hold of your heart, you know, and, uh, and bless you in such a way, you just can't help it but to say praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. By the way, did you know that word hallelujah is a heavenly word? Understand, Brother Ron, you can go anywhere in the world tonight and say hallelujah. 
or hallelujah, which, and it would not be strange to them. It's a heavenly word. And I read over there in the 19th chapter of Revelation, uh, there in, in heaven, you know, where they're going to be going to hear it four times there in that 19th chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So uh, who's going to do it? David said, I will. Whether anybody else does it or not, I will. So who? I will. What? Well, he said, I will bless the Lord. Now, just in case you might have a question as to whether it's all right to bless the Lord or not, or praise the Lord, or say amen, or hallelujah, just hold your finger right there. Would you do that? And flip over with me, if you will, please, uh, to the last chapter in the book of Psalms, chapter 150. Would you flip over there with me, please? And they're just six simple verses, and I'm going to read all six of them, okay? And as I read them, don't count out loud, but to yourself, count how many times the word praise shows up here. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psalter and the harp. Praise him with the timbre and the dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud sounding cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. How many times? Thirteen. Is that what you got? Thirteen. And it didn't kill him. Amen? Didn't kill him, did it? All right, now, now, okay, let's not stop there. Look at the last verse of Psalm 149, verse 9. To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all of his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Look at the last verse, Psalm 148, verse 14. He also exhort the horn of his people, the praise of all of his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Look at the last verse, Psalm 147, verse 20. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgment, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Look like first Psalm 146, verse 10. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, all generation. Praise ye the Lord. And then you're familiar with that uh, uh, chapter 103, are you not, where uh, the psalmist writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that was in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who uh, healeth all of thy diseases, and forgiveth all thine iniquities, and etc., etc. So there's nothing wrong with saying, Praise the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. It won't hurt you to do that. To learn to listen. Are you listening? I promise you, this is the quietest world you'll ever live in. Amen. <laughs> I guarantee you. I, I've had a few of my friends uh, that enjoy their salvation of only down here on earth. They've already passed on going to heaven. I guarantee the way they carried on down here, up there, I guarantee it won't be quiet for you anywhere around them. Amen. And so there's nothing wrong with just saying, Praise the Lord. So who? I will. What? Bless the Lord. When? All right, let's look and see in verse 34. I will bless the Lord when I feel good. Huh? Oh, it didn't say that? Listen, it's not hard to bless the Lord or praise the Lord when you feel real good. But listen, I heard Bill Stafford, a evangelist friend of mine, say one time, Honey, if you can only shout or praise the Lord when you feel good and can't do it when you feel bad, you're not a real shouter because you're shouting on your feeling, not on your faith. Amen? Let me say that again. If you only shout when you feel good and you can't shout when you feel bad, you're not a real shouter because you're shouting on your feeling, not on your faith. Mm. So, let's try it again. I'll bless the Lord when all my bills are paid. Well, you probably will, <laughs> but that's all what it says. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll bless the Lord when the sun is shining. Mm. 
I will bless the Lord at all times. That means good times, bad times, snow time, sunshine, things go good, things go bad, bills paid, bills not paid, feel good, don't feel good. huh? And so we're to bless the Lord at all times. Why not? Romans 8, 28, for we do know that all things, implying good and bad, are working together for the good to them that love God. To them are the called according to his purpose. So I will bless the Lord at all times. Uh, several years ago, I went over to Fletcher, North Carolina for a revival meeting about the middle of October. And the weather had changed. And I ran into snow uh, going over the mountain in the middle of October. Well, with the weather changing that drastically, I <clears throat> kind of affected my voice a little bit. I was able to go the meeting, but affected my voice. And uh, when I left home, all three of my children at that time, I had three at that time, had the croup. Do you ever remember what the, <coughs> the croup was? And you just couldn't hardly get your breath? Well, all three of them had it. One of them so bad, we had to put her in a croup tent. There's about 17 other children in there at that time it must have been something that's going around bad at that uh, the epidemic must have been bad at that particular time and so here I was leaving three children at home and uh, sick and uh, and uh, uh, snow on the mountain my voice not feeling good and uh, and so uh, you know one one morning I, I, I knew my tire was leaking a little bit in, on my car so I thought I'd go out and drive down the surf stage while the preacher out running around doing something. I'd go down and get, uh, get my tire checked and fixed and went out and turned the ignition. Not a sound. Fairly new car, not a sound, that battery. And so there I was, battery dead, tire going down, not feeling good with my throat, three children homesick. And, uh, and the devil seemed to say, boy, <laughs> some fellow you are, <laughs> some preacher, you, you got a big God, huh? Said the devil, oh yeah. You know, he'll, he'll jump on your shoulder and try to push you down, you know. And so uh, I thought, well, I'll just wait till the, uh, you know, to, 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 to the uh, preacher gets back here. And, and I'll just open my trunk and I'll change that tire, put another tire on. When he gets back, we'll get the battery somehow jumped off. We'll go down and get that tire fixed. And when I open up that trunk, here the devil started to get, hey, man. Here, you don't feel good. Your throat messed up and your three children homesick and, 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 and your battery's dead and your tire's flat and you're a preacher. Man, he'd like to close me in that trunk and smother me to death. I know what that rascal liked to have done. And right up, I promise you, right up, in, in, practically in the middle of that trunk, I just hollered out and said, Praise the Lord anyhow. Amen. And when I said that, well, he's like the uh, Lord got the devil to see the paints and kicked him out of that car. And I just had a time. I said earlier, did I not, that praise will help deliver you out of the most of the difficulties that you find yourself in as a child of God. But I'll bless the Lord at all times. Amen. So who? What? When? Where? Well, let's see. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, it's good to praise the Lord by lip, by life, and by love. But David said, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Isn't it wonderful to just praise the Lord through your lips? You know what I found out? I found out when you learn to praise the Lord through your lips... It helps to get a lot of those other impurities out of your system. Amen? None of us are perfect. We all have problems we, and that we have to deal with. But when you learn to praise the Lord through your lips, He'll help get a, uh, rid of a lot of those other things within your system. Uh, you may have heard about the old farmer. In other words, it'll, it'll help get the bad taste, what I'm trying to say. It'll help get the bad taste out of your mouth when you learn to praise the Lord, you know. You may have heard about the old farmer whose crops were felony. His wife was facing emergency surgery. And his boy was about to have to drop out of school. And so he went down to the bank 
to see if he could get a loan. And the uh, banker said, could I help you? He said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I've got problems, sir. He said, my crops are failing me. My wife's facing emergency surgery. And my boy's about to have to drop out of school. I need some money bad, and I need it quick. And I need your help. And uh, the banker looked at him and said, well, sir, I, I understand that you have a need. But he said, what, what, what kind of collateral do you have? What can you put up? In other words, old farmer said, collateral? He didn't know what he thought. Collateral? I don't know about collateral, sir. I just know I need money. I know I need a loan. I need your help. And the bank said, well, sir, I understand that, but we have rules and regulations here, and, 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 and you know, uh, we, we just need some type of collateral, something you could put up, you know, to, to kind of give us some hope if something went wrong. We said, well... They just continued back and forth discussing the matter. Well, the farmer maybe, I'll let you decide, maybe had made a bad choice. He had brought his dog along with him to the bank. And the dog was sitting right there beside his master listening to the conversation between the banker and his master, the farmer. Well, when the dog after a while noticed the banker wasn't too much in agreement with his master, the farmer, the, the dog jumped up, bit the banker. Well, the, the, the farmer grabbed the dog and started out of the bank with the dog, and the dog bit two other patrons in the bank. Well, the next scene was in court, and the judge looked down across the desk at that old farmer and said, Sir, may I ask you a question? Yes, sir, said the old farmer. Why did you ever bring such a vicious dog into the bank to begin with? They use an old country word that, the old farmer said, Judge, I'll have you know my dog ain't vicious. Your dog isn't vicious? Sir, my dog's never been vicious. Well, if your dog's not vicious, sir, said the judge, look over there at that banker with his arm all bandaged up. Why do he do that if he's not vicious? And look over there at those two patrons that were in the bank at that time and what he's done to them. If your dog's not vicious, why do you buy those two patrons? The old farmer looked up that judge and said, Judge, sir, your honor, sir, I don't know why. I don't know why that, that my dog bit those two patrons, but I think I do know why he bit that blessed banker. He wanted to get the bad taste out of his mouth. <laughs> Did you get it? Praise can help you get the bad taste. Out of your mouth and out of your system. When you learn to praise the Lord from your heart. So who? I will. What? Bless the Lord. When? At all times. Where? In my mouth. Why? Okay. First of all, you do it for encouragement. Look in verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof. And be glad. You don't know who may be around you who's really just practically at wit's end. Down in the dumps, discouraged, despondent, uh, no hope, seem like in their life. And just don't know where they're going to turn next. They hear you say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, in the Lord, wonderful. You never know whom you might encourage that might be around you when you praise the Lord. Huh? Yeah. So one reason for praising the Lord, why? Is to incur for encouragement to others who may be around you that need a word of encouragement. Another reason for praising the Lord is for fellowship. Look in verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You do it for fellowship. Don't you just enjoy being around people that like to talk about the Lord? Yeah. Now, I enjoy talking about different things. I enjoy talking about uh, sports. I enjoy talking about gardening. I enjoy talking about farming. I enjoy talking about a lot of things. But if you're around me long and all, after a while, and I don't say it boldly, but we're going to be talking about the Lord and his goodness and his blessings and what God's doing, what's going on, you know. And so isn't it just good to, to be around 
people that love the Lord and like to talk about the Lord, and it's good fellowship. If you want your old dog to get fleas, turn him loose with a bunch of flea dogs. Bring in all kind of them. And it does matter with whom you run and with whom you associate with. Amen. It makes a difference. I heard Bob Harrington, chaplain Bourbon Street, when I was at Milligan. I went up one night when he was at Elizabeth, had that red tie or bow tie. I think it was, I don't know, I can't remember if it was a bow tie or red tie, but that was kind of characteristic. And a red Bible, I believe. But he, he just pushed the stand aside, and he got up that night and he talked on three things that makes a difference in your life. The Christ you know, the people you associate with, and the convictions you share. It does matter with whom you run. But why praise the Lord? For fellowship. Amen? It's good just to be around people that love to talk about Jesus. Then why praise the Lord? Verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. You praise the Lord. Why? For encouragement to others. For fellowship with others. And for power. Read verse 4 again. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Hold your finger there and turn over to Psalm 50. Would you do that real quickly? Psalm 50. And I want to share a verse with you there. This basically, uh, it's different words, but he's basically saying in, in this verse, what we've just read in verse 4, chapter 34. Verse 23, the last verse of Psalm 50. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth or setteth his conversation or conduct aright, will I show the salvation or the deliverance of God. He's saying basically there what he's saying in verse 4 of chapter 34. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Did you know that praise is mightier than armies? Did you know that? Flip back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 for a moment. Would you do that, please? 2 Chronicles chapter 20. To give you a little bit of background, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir had come up against King Jehoshaphat in Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord comes to King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicle chapter 20, and verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. I like that. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Zeus, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah... The, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on hand. And they rose early in the morning, verse 20, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and be and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophet, prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, uh, uh, and to say, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. That's not a fairy tale. That's a literal happening. 
Suppose that uh, Russia attacked the United States this evening and the president called Congress together and said the Russians are attacking. We must do something quickly. We're going to have to declare war. But we're not going to use any artillery of any time, any time as far as guns and tanks and bombs, atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs and nuclear weapons. I'm not going to use any horses or swords. Or I'm just going to go down to West Point and get the, the best choir I can find down there. And we're going to go out facing the Russians singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord God Almighty, and he's going to smite the Russians. That's ridiculous, Brother Tooney. Don't get ahead of yourself now. It happened back then. We better not knock something we hadn't tried. But what I want you to see is, praise was mightier than armies. Praise was mightier than armies. <laughs> It's also stronger than stone walls. Would you look in Joshua chapter 6, please? Joshua chapter 6. Verse 8 and following. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and the blew, and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them and the armed men went before the priest and blew with the trumpets and the reward, reward came after the ark, the priest going on blowing with the trumpets and Joshua had, con, had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then you shall shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city uh, going about it once, they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the, of the Lord, and the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp, so did they six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of this day, and compass the city of, of, after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city uh, seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua, Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city. And the walls came tumbling down. Praise Mightier than armies. Stronger than stone walls. Also stronger than stone prison jail doors. Okay. If you would please look over in Acts 16. They're stronger than the jail doors. Acts 16. Sixteen and verse twenty five. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. They were free to go, had they so desired. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposed that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. For we're all still here. Nobody left. <laughs> I don't know if they so 
astounded with the earthquake or couldn't understand how Paul and Silas, two old preachers, are singing in those kind of circumstances at that time at night. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Yes, you might say a revival broke loose at midnight. Praise is mightier than armies, stronger than stone walls, stronger than stone prisons or prison doors. And so God teaches. I said, God teaches to know how to praise him. To pray, yes, but I'm talking about praise tonight. So, who? I will. What? Bless the Lord. When? At all times. Where? In my mouth. Why? For encouragement, for fellowship, and for power. Praise is mightier than armies. Stronger than stone walls, stronger than stone prison doors. And if it's that powerful of an element, why should any Christian choose to leave that element out of your Christian life? You know what we've done as Baptists? There used to be a time when Baptists shouted. Did you know that? I mean, it's a whole, yeah. And uh, used to be a time when the Methodists shouted. Matter of fact, they used to call them the old shouting Methodists. And I guess same with the Presbyterians. But then in recent decades, some of the newer groups, the, uh, the Charismatics and Pentecostals and others, and I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to illustrate a point. Uh, they, they've come in on the scene, and, and, and I don't know, I'll leave that up to them and the Lord, but, but, but sometimes you wonder, you know, if sometimes they don't maybe take that element of praise sometimes a little beyond means, but, but that's between them and God. But as a result of that, we as Baptists have kindly backed off, Ronnie, because we don't, want by, we don't want somebody to think we might be a charismatic or a Pentecostal. I tell people I'm a Baptocostal. Amen? Whatever that's supposed to be. But there's nothing wrong with praising no. the Lord. Okay. Somebody said, praise without prayer would be presumption. Prayer without praise is unbelief. But prayer and praise united becomes faith. For prayer says, Lord, please. And praise says, thank you, Lord. I can consider it to be done. Pray and believe ye shall receive. Pray and doubt, do without. I don't want to do without, do you? I want that which I desperately need from the Lord. So praise without prayer would be presumption. Prayer without praise is unbelief. But prayer and praise together become faith. So Lord, teach us not just how to pray, but teach us, Lord, to praise you. Who? I will. What? Bless the Lord. When? At all times. Where? In my mouth. Why? Uh, for encouragement, for fellowship, for power. And um, whosoever offereth praise, Psalm 50 verse 23, glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth or says his conduct right before God, will I show the salvation or deliverance of God. Lord, help us not to be ashamed to praise you. Wherever we may be, help us not to be ashamed. Amen? Yeah. It's strange how we can go out to a ball game and holler like a Comanche Indian and come to church and sit like a wooden Indian. Me here to hear preacher preach. Me here to hear singer sing. But don't get me excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with praising the Lord, is there? Let's bow our heads for just a moment, can we? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. My priest, just a simple message tonight. I've been in between two or three sermons today, just didn't hardly know which one, but I believe the Lord always has a way of settling on the right one, and I believe this is what he wanted for us tonight. We do need to learn to praise him from our hearts, don't we? We really, really do. I know I've not preached to the lost per se tonight, I preached a message for the children of the Lord. But uh, 
If you're here tonight and you're not saved, the Lord knew you was going to be here, and he loves you, and he wants to save you. I just wonder if we might have somebody, man, woman, boy, or girl, oldest, youngest, largest, or the smallest. We just remember like you'd say, Brother Tony, I, I'm going to be honest with you. If I was to die tonight, I don't know to go to heaven. Jesus would come. I don't know I'd be with him. Will you pray for me? I'd be delighted. I'd be thrilled to do that. Would you raise your hand? Is there one like that anywhere? Well, I, I don't see him. I, I think, you know, as far as I can tell, it looks like most of your Christians and are saved. I, I'm, I'm glad you're saved. But how many of you would say tonight, Brother Tooney, I know I'm saved. But if, if the element of praise, if the element of praise, P-R-A-I-S-E, is that important in the life of a child of God, I certainly, Brother Tooney, don't want to get left out on it. I want to get in on this very important element for every Christian, not just for one group or this group or that group. It's for every child of God. We need to learn to praise the Lord. And again, I say, I'm not talking about you coming to church and trying to whip up something in the image of the flesh. I'm just talking about when the Lord gets a hold of your heart and bless you so you just can't help it, but say, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I wonder how many of you lift your hand right now and say, Brother Tony, will you pray for me that wherever I'm at, at church, at home, down, down on the street, on the job, uh, wherever I'm at, pray for me, Brother Tony. I'd never be ashamed of my Lord to where I wouldn't be willing to say praise the Lord if he encouraged me to do that. Would you raise your hand tonight if you mean that? Raise it up high let me see it, would you? That's wonderful. God bless you. My Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for the privilege to be here in this service. And I pray now, Lord, that in this invitation part of the service, would you speak to hearts in a special way and help us to do that which the Spirit of God would bid us to do. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful element of praise. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God who inhabits the praise of your people. Lord, you, you love to be praised. And we want to praise you tonight. And we thank you for all that you are and what you are. And, and thank you for what you've done for us. We praise you. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to uh, get practice up tonight for what